You ever have those moments when everything's okay? The everyday of everything is okay, and then it's not. Just like that, it's not okay. There's a place east of Eden where everything falls apart. It's always east of Eden. East of Eden is that place where humanity has wandered into the dawning sun of a day that they have tried to create. You see, the story of creation begins all throughout Genesis 1, the first pages of Scripture, with a model of how the day is measured. It says, and there was evening and there was morning on the first day, and there was evening and there was morning on the second and the third and the fourth. This is the model of Scripture, evening to morning. But we find humanity leaving that place on the east. After having tried to grasp power for themselves, uh, grasp power out of, out of God's provision, grasp power without God. I remember a line from The Prince of Egypt, that great animated movie that DreamWorks did in the 90s, one of my favorites to this day. And the Pharaoh Ramses II in that movie said, I am the rising sun. And so often, humanity east of Eden has bought the lie that the dawn rises with our grasping for power. And so we have wandered east of Eden. You see, in, in the creation story where there is evening and there is morning on the first and the second and the third day, it tells us a story that God's work always begins in the darkness, in the nothing. The, the parts of our life where we can't control it, we can't make it, uh, we can't feel our way through it, we can't see what is next. God begins to work in the nothingness of the darkness, creating something out of nothing. The day must begin in the darkness. It must begin in the darkness or else we will begin to think that we are the ones who make the sun rise. So when Adam and Eve depart the garden, after ha having tried to grasp that knowledge for themselves, knowledge apart from God, they exit Eden to the east as if they are the morning sun. It is a lie. For the day begins in the darkness where only God can speak light. It is east of Eden that we live. It is, it is east of Eden that we live in the lie that tells us that we are the ones who make the light shine. And so we find in those first chapters of Genesis, and check this out on your own, those first 11 chapters of Genesis, the, the part of the story that we call prehistory, because we can't date it. And in that story, there is always a movement. Humanity is always moving east. It's always further east. It begins with Adam and Eve leaving the garden on its eastern edge. And then again, when Cain kills his brother over a religious dispute. <laughs> you do realize it was a religious dispute. Whose sacrifice is better than the other. And history has followed from that day where brother continues to kill brother. And on that day, um, oh, when they ended that religious dispute with blood shed on the ground where God himself shows up and says, uh, the ground is crying out with your brother's blood, Cain wanders to the land of Nod into the east. Further, further from that place where God had, had begun all things. Further from that place where they had walked with God in the cool of the evening. And the story continues even after the great flood, even after the migration of that boat on top of the waters, that great deluge that was meant to baptize and purify the world. It didn't work the way we had hoped because even then Abraham or Noah's descendants Ham, Shem, and Japheth, Shem in particular, his descendants through whom Abraham's line would later ascend, his descendants settled, you guessed it, in the east. And also, it was in the east on that great plain of Shinar that Shem's descendants decided they would make a name for 
themselves. They would build a tower that would reach to the heavens. They didn't need God. They could ascend there themselves. And so they settled. This is important. They settled in that land. They ignored the voice of God that had said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, fill the earth. And they settled on that great plain of Shinar in the east. Go back, check the story. It's always to the east, always further from that place where God's realm of creation and heaven intersected, that place where God and humanity dwell together, that thin place between heaven and earth. Humanity wanders always further to the east. Somewhere east of Eden, our lives fall apart. John Steinbeck, in his great, his cumulative work written in the early 1950s that bears a title that may be familiar to you, especially in context of this sermon. Uh, the book is entitled East of Eden, and it is an exploration of human, humanity's depravity. The, the, uh, the good things and the bad things, but the bad things destroy it seems, everything. And in this book, in this book, East of Eden, he has some great lines. Let me pick out a couple. This is the literary geek in me coming out. Here's what he says. An unbelieved truth can hurt a man much more than a lie. It takes great courage to back truth that is deemed unacceptable to our times. There's a punishment for it, and it's usually crucifixion. Hmm. This is the life east of Eden, where the lie that began the whole tenuous journey away from God causes us to settle into the brokenness of empty and barren lives. Again, from Steinbeck's novel, we hear a warning. It's a hard thing to leave any deeply routine life, even if you hate it. Is that true? It's a hard thing to leave any deeply routine life, even if you hate it. Which brings us to our passage today. You see, it comes as no surprise to us that we are first introduced to the family of Abram. Uh, it, it comes as no surprise that we find them in the eastern land of Ur of the Chaldeans, east, always Further east, it's located in what is today the modern-day Iraq. With no loss of irony in the biblical text, this same Ur of the Chaldeans would later become the nation of Babylon. This is where Abram was called from, or so we think. There's a part of this story that we have missed, and today we're going to spend most of our time in that part of the story. We're going to look at the words because Scripture tells us so little of Abraham's life in Ur that every word counts more. So we've got to, we've got to read what it says, and at some points maybe read between the lines just a little bit without losing the integrity of Scripture itself. So here's what we know. We know, uh, we know that, he, uh, that he is the son of Terah and the wife of Sarai. Now, names are different than what you are familiar with. Abram would become Abraham. Later on in the story, when the covenant of God is enacted with Abraham, and that, that H-A in the middle of his name is shorthand for the name of God. It's almost like Abram takes the name of God into the center of his life. And the same with Sarai. Sarai would become Sarah with that same, now it's not an, a, a, an H-A, now it's an A-H, but it's the same Hebrew root coming right into the center of their lives. And now, admittedly, today as I preach, all of the story centers around Abram and Sarai. You'll forgive me, if an, you get an occasional Abraham and Sarah. It's not intended, it's just habit. But here's what we know about the story. He has two brothers, one of whom is deceased, a man by the name of Haran. And Haran had a son, a man by the name of Lot. Lot is going to have an important role 
in this story over the next few chapters. But something emerges in the storyline that I have missed all of my years of preaching and teaching this passage. In fact, every week I meet with a group of preachers and we go through similar texts together and, and, and we pick each other's brains. How are you dealing with this? Here's what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. Can I steal what you're doing? I'll do that. Right, we do this. Every Tuesday we do this. And I, I took a poll of those that I gather with on Tuesday and they... They didn't know this. I, I meet once a month with the pastors here in Derby around a lunch table. We did that this past Wednesday, and I pulled this verse out, and I said, hey, have you guys seen this? And they're like, no. This always excites me <laughs> when this happens. And so this is kind of where I want to start the story. In, in the thing that we have missed, because we have said Abram or Abraham is from Ur of the Chaldeans, and that is true, but did you know God did not call Abram from Ur of the Chaldeans? Listen again to what it says. This is why I read those tedious verses in chapter 11. It said, Terah, Terah is Abram's father. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went together from Ur of the Chaldeans, listen, to go into the land of Canaan. Terah was moving his family to Canaan. They all left Ur of the Chaldeans together. I always thought Abram was called out of Ur of the Chaldeans and left his homeland behind. And he did, in a sense, but he didn't leave it without his whole family. And it wasn't at God's calling, it was at Terah's behest. And what's interesting is that they settled along the way in this region, this town. Maybe it was a city-state, probably not quite that expansive, but this area of Haran. Now, there's an interesting point in here. Do you remember the name of Terah's deceased son? Haran. But in this little town somewhere between Ur of the Chaldeans and Canaan where they were going, there's also this region called Haran. Interesting, isn't it? We don't know why Terah left. L let's speculate. We can't make more, we can't say more than what scripture says, but let's, let's speculate, knowing that all of this is taken with a grain of salt. Maybe, here's what I've speculated, maybe Terah got a call like Abram did. Maybe God intended that lineage to begin a generation earlier. But maybe Tara didn't go all the way. There's something about faithfulness that goes all the way. I have a father who, when he was a little bit younger than I am now, but it, relatively the same age, established in life, mid 40s, a, a career, a family, four kids, a, a living on a farm, or surrounded by his family. He heard the voice of God saying, now in your mid-40s, I'm calling you to become a pastor. Leave your land, your country, your kindred, and go to the land I will show you. It happened to be Colorado Springs. He went and as a 40-year-old man, did a uh, four-year undergraduate degree. And then moved in 1993 with his family of, with five kids at this point. It was a land flowing with milk and honey, apparently. Fruitful land. Um, uh, left, uh, left in 1993 to go to Iowa where he pastored one church for almost 30 years. He went all the way. Do you know when I received my call, how much easier it was because of his faithfulness? Maybe Tara had gotten the call that Abram, uh, we don't know, uh, that's speculation. Or maybe, that maybe there's a key in here for us, he had lost his son. And sometimes when you've lost someone so close, you can't be where their presence is so absent. The, the, the presence of absence, you understand that? That ache, that phone that doesn't ring, that mattress that has always had that indentation next to you and it no longer does, 
the home that rings with all of the memories, every corner you turn, every, every picture you look at, and sometimes you say, I just can't be here anymore. Maybe that's what happened. I don't, we're speculating. There, the, the passage doesn't tell us, but it is interesting that he picked up and he left with his whole family, minus one son, and the very place he settled was the place that bore his son's name. Sometimes our brokenness leaves us in this unsettled land where we can't move past it. Now, I'm not saying that Terah or Abram or any of the family was meant to move past their loss. But sometimes our loss can keep us from moving at all. We don't know. But here they are. They settled in this halfway land, halfway between Ur uh, and Canaan. Halfway, not quite there, and not quite where they've come from. And that halfway land, we find, is a land of barrenness. Here's what it says. Scripture says that when he and his family got to Haran, he settled there. The same word is used for the Tower of Babel, where they settled on the plain of Shinar. And it goes contrary to the voice of God. Uh, Throughout all of these chapters, God's command has been to go, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And they settled. And so here's the question for us today. Where in your eastward migrations have you settled? Where has your wandering reach that has been reaching in the opposite direction of God's promises? Have you settled? Or maybe in those places where you heard the voice of God and you began to move, but you didn't go all the way. Where have you settled? Where have you settled in your life? Isn't that a hard question? When we're teaching our our children about how to make a choice for a lifelong partner, we often say, don't settle. Don't settle, right? And if you wonder who, what settling looks like, talk to me. I will let you know for sure. <laughs> and and I, will, I will thin out the playing field, right? Uh, but, but where in our lives have we settled? Where are those halfway points where you are never quite where you were and never quite where you need to be. It's a land of barrenness. You see, this has always been our problem. Ever since we made that eastward move out of the garden, we have always tried to settle in those places that allow us to compromise between where we've been and where we, ha- where we need to be. It's, for me, it's, it's evidenced in a song lyric um, by, uh, by the singer-songwriter Paul David Hewson. You know him, right? Bono? Uh, much better name, right? Poet, songwriter, um, believer in Jesus Christ, though his lifestyle sometimes betrays his own words, I will admit. But he writes these words in one of his songs. He says, and I'm a long long way from the hill of Calvary, and I'm a long way from where I was and where I need to be. Settled. See, this begs the question for each of us. Is this where you're supposed to be? Now, I'm not talking necessarily about Derby, Kansas, though though maybe that is part of what God is speaking into your life. I, I lament something that has happened in our Christian, uh, our, our training facilities for pastors. I lament something that has happened. You see, they have moved all to online, to the convenient classroom. And I understand that this is the 21st century, and I understand that time moves on and we've got to move with it. But there is something, especially for the pastor, especially for the missionary, of that call for training that requires you to leave your father's house, leave what you know, and to move because most pastors live an itinerant life. 
there is something about this. So maybe when I say, um, where are you? Where are you supposed to be? Maybe it's not in a physical sense about Derby, but maybe it is. Maybe God is calling you. I say, listen to that voice. But for most of us, that call is something more internal. Something more or less defined. Those parts of our life, maybe, where we've just settled for what is easiest, what is most convenient, what is least painful. Sometimes our proclivity to go part of the way is the lie that, has deceived, that deceives us into thinking that we are where we are supposed to be. So we settle down, we hunker down, my four and no more. I have no way to rhyme with six. So we settle down, we hunker down, and we try to live in these in-between places and spaces where we have one foot in two worlds. That's not possible. Jesus would say you cannot serve both God and any other God. In this case, that God was mammon, the, the, the God of the world, but it fits with any God. You cannot be in two places and be present where you're at. It becomes barrenness. What you find is these in-between settled lands quickly become very unsettling in our lives, the angst, the angst that keeps us awake, the, the unsettled uh, settling in our, that settles in on our soul, that, that, that keeps our pulses high, our blood pressure racing, and always wondering why God it just seems out of reach. Or maybe, to remind ourselves again of Steinbeck's words, it's a hard thing to leave any deeply, deeply routine life even if you hate it. But into that barren landscape, we once again hear the voice of God. God always speaks into barrenness and brokenness. God always speaks into the nothing of our life, and out of it comes something if we will listen. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. Notice where Terah was going to Canaan. He knew where he was going. Now, Abram does not have that security of an arrival point. He only hears the call to go. I remember Dana and I, we had graduated from Nazarene Bible College, my dad's alma mater. You see, his journey made my journey that much easier. And we had interviewed at a church in Missouri Valley, Iowa. Now, Anybody that is confused about what state they're in should be red flags. Missouri Valley, <laughs> Iowa. We had interviewed there, and we were waiting for a call on a vote, a board vote. And, and we had this magic number in our head of yeas versus nays. And if the yeas did not meet our low threshold, we knew that was a voice from God. The problem was they were delaying the vote again and again and again. And the problem was we were moving. We were out of our house. We were in a truck. We were on Highway 24 heading towards Lyman, Colorado, waiting for a phone call. Would we be going up to I-80 and going to Missouri Valley, Iowa, or would we be jumping on I-70 and going to Kansas City, Kansas. We didn't know. I was driving a 24-foot truck. Dana was in a car, and finally I got a call, and I called Dana, and I said, this was the vote, and Dana says, I guess we're going I-70, and we went to Kansas City. Sometimes the call to go doesn't come with a destination. But you'll never know until you go. And this is how it happened with Abram. Uh, so so here, here we hear these words again. He says, go and I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you can be a great nation. Is that what it says? No. I will make you a great nation so that you will be a blessing to all nations. 
This is kind of an aside, a parenthetical to the sermon itself. So hear this for what it's worth. Um, wherever you are blessed, wherever you can count your blessings, it is not for your sake alone. You are blessed to be a blessing. So there it is. That's the parentheses. That's the sermon within a sermon. But now, here we hear this call for Abram. It was from Haran that Abram was called, not from Ur of the Chaldeans. He was called from Haran. He was halfway there, but halfway there is still not there. He was in this in-between land of, uh, of unsettled settling where Terah had led his family, but where Terah had taken everything he had, his family in particular, everything he had known. Now comes the call to Abram with the new imperative, go from your country, from your kindred, from your father's house to the land, I will show you. You see, first the call to go is first and foremost a call to leave. In order to go, we've got to leave. We like the idea of going, don't we? But leaving, all the things we leave, that's hard. How often do we try to carry everything with us? All of our past, all of our baggage, all of our hurts, all of the things we have always known, all of the things we have always done, those old routines that as much as we hate them, we can't break them. We want to go like Tara, but we really don't want to have to leave. Yet God's voice comes into the nothingness, the barrenness of our in-between lives and tells us that in order to go, we must first leave. Can I tell you, church, there is an imperative for us in this, isn't there? We want so much to be about the work of God, but we want so much to hang on to the things that have been hanging on to us all along. The call it to go is a call to leave. And what's startling about God's call to Abram is the promise that he invokes, I will make you a great nation. And in you, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. You see, that promise is almost laughable, isn't it? Because the name Abram means exalted father. But Abram is now 75 years old. And he's never born a child. His wife has never born a child. It says Sarai is barren. And I don't care if you're in the Old Testament or the New Testament. There comes a time in your life <laughs> when you stop having kids. And I don't know what that magic number is. 75 seems to be as good as any. <laughs> right? They had settled in. And the exalted father with his bride, Sarah, whose name means princess. So the exalted father and, and his princess wife who have no children are told with some kind of sick joke that they're going to become a nation of people. Uh, so for this man, this exalted father and his princess wife, where there had been nothing but sorrow, nothing but empty cribs, childless homes, a dead brother, and only a nephew for an inheritor, God speaks, and somehow their lives, east of Eden, were the exact opposite of God's promise, command in Eden to be fruitful and multiply. The barrenness that happens east of Eden had made it all the way to the home of Abram. Life had taken them into the wastes east of Eden only to discover that what waited for them in the barren landscape was nothing more than barren lives. Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann, one of my heroes, still teaching and preaching at 97 years old, he writes, barrenness is the way of human history. It is an effective metaphor for hopelessness. There is no foreseeable future in this land, there is no power to invent our own future. Barrenness. Now, here in this, there, there, there needs to be a warning because this passage and this sermon is not intended to speak to those in our own congregation or beyond who have struggled with infertility. This is not the point of the sermon, nor, uh, nor am I invoking these promises as a cure for your grief. It is a grief that Dana and I know. And there is no cure for that grief, we know. 
So this is not about, about whether you have pleased or displeased God, and that's why you can or cannot bear children. That is not the way God works. That is not God. The infertility in your life is a result of the brokenness of the world, not a result of the benevolence or malevolence of God. So hear this. When I speak of barrenness today, for those of you whose sole desire is to bear children, bear a child, this is not what this is about. So hear the metaphor in it for those of us that live in the barrenness of our own broken lives. You see, when our futures have failed, when our dreams have become nothing more than barren lives, lived in the familiarity of our brokenness, God calls us. He calls us as we are broken and despondent out of dead ends and into a promise. But we must first leave. We must first leave the things we have known and we must enter into the unknown. Unknown by us, but known, known by God. This is what faith is. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is not convincing yourself of something. Faith is the action of stepping into the unknown of what God has promised. It is a journey into God's promises, step by step. We don't understand it all. If we understood it all, we wouldn't call it faith. So step by step, we must move. We must become pilgrims, travelers, strangers, aliens, immigrants in unknown lands, in, in faraway territories, these places and these spaces where God is beckoning us. God's call is always leading us into the expanse of something new at the expense of all that is old. You must respond then with one of two options. Either you will stay put and you will, uh, you will settle in that place of safety and security, that place where you have uh, found what you deem to be contentment, but the dark nights betray your own contentment. You can settle there with your barrenness, your barren lives, your brokenness and your emptiness and the wounds that, that, that continue to haunt you, or you can pick up and you can move what, what has always been into, into, God's, into what God has fully promised. You can pick up and leave into the promises of God. I'm reminded of Jesus' words in Mark 8.35 and other places throughout the Gospels. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will Save it. These words sound harsh sometimes to our ears. Take up a cross and follow me. Because they do not tickle us. They do not, uh, they do not tease us with niceties, with a pat on the back that says, okay, it's just, it's, it's just fine. It's just fine. Where you're at is fine. No, these words demand something of us, and they call out our barrenness for what it is. Sin. It's the brokenness of sin creeping into our lives. This always happens east of Eden. And it reminds us that fruitless lives are not his design. But where they seem harsh to us because they call our brokenness by its true name, sin, these words are really words of love that say that that barren and broken life needs to die. If you would love that life, that life will kill you. If you would allow that life to be crucified, you will find new life. And it is a promise of love to us. Will it be easy? No. The cross reminds us of that. Will it be worth it? Yes. The empty tomb promises that. So, you've wandered. East of Eden. You've wandered. So what? So have I. We are the brotherhood of humanity. We have wandered. 
We have all wandered into the east further and further from that place where we have started. And as soon as we arrive at every next destination, every destination that promises the rising sun but only delivers barrenness and brokenness, every time we arise, we realize that the next promise of that wrong way journey is really just a discovery of our own barrenness and our own brokenness where we settle. So today is the day. Today is the day to turn around, to head back to that place that God has promised will become a land of promise for you. You can be like Tara and go only halfway, but soon, soon you will discover that halfway there is exactly the same as nowhere at all. Into this nothing, God calls. God still calls. Do you hear it? The invitation is simple. It is simple. It's come home. Isn't that a simple invitation? Come home. Come home, wayward child. Come home. Your life is empty. The land, the land is fruitless. And the barrenness of your own brokenness is the only legacy you can claim. But God is calling. God is still calling. Come home. Come home. You've wandered into the east Did you know there is an ancient tradition in Scripture that suggests that Jesus will return? From what direction? The east. Scripture talks about how his return will be like the lightning that splits the sky from the east to the west. And so we have looked for the return of Christ in the east. Isn't that interesting? The east in Genesis means distance from God. But where does Jesus oh, where does Jesus come from? From the east. And there's a message for us. As far as you wander, Jesus is beginning to gather up. In, a, in our brokenness, in our barrenness, in our wandering, he's gathering us up. And in his east to westward movement, he invites us on the journey, the call to go to the land he will show us, to leave the barrenness behind us, to follow him. You see, this is the promise that we have in Christ where his kingdom is fulfilled. But it begins even now for us where his invitation needs to be fulfilled in your life. So if you've been listening carefully, you probably heard three things. Let me name them. Some of you, like all of us, have wandered so far into the east that you don't even know what... It means to have a relationship with God at all. You stopped hearing that voice. Maybe you've never really heard it. I guarantee you, you have, because the second you start listening, you recognize he's been speaking all along. But maybe for you, this is an invitation to hear that voice for the first time. We, We might call that salvation. To hear that voice, to turn around. For some of you, Maybe God has been dealing specifically with a call in your life. Maybe something that needs to be left behind. Maybe a call that needs to be entered into. There's big calls. There's small calls. They're all calls from the divine. Some of you may be pastors waiting to move for training. Some of you may be missionaries waiting for that assignment to a far-off country or maybe missionaries to the person next door. Some of, the, some of you may have callings exactly in the places of your employment or at the gas station where you see that attendant every day. You see, there is a calling. And the question is, is will you say yes? So that's the second message. Salvation, will you hear the voice? Uh, second, those of you that have heard the voice, will you respond to it? And third, I think this is for most of the church. Where have you settled? What barrenness has become a part of your life that's just normal? It's just who you are. And now you recognize it. You see, Scripture calls that movement from that place of barrenness. For those of us that hear the voice of God, it calls it something sacred and divine and special. It calls it sanctification. It doesn't mean that you are picked up from Ur of the Chaldeans or Haran or wherever you are on the journey and placed immediately into the promised land. But what it does mean is that you recognize your barren land 
and you've heard the voice of God and you're passing that threshold of the total commitment and saying, I'm going all the way, all the way, all the way. Question today, how will you respond to the call of God? The invitation is simple, come home.